Um, time and time again, I keep on hearing from business owners um, that in order for their business to be uh, successful, they have to go into things like, you know, selling alcohol or like, you know, doing shisha maybe or, you know, getting a loan out. And, you know, the reason is that everyone else is doing it. That's the reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear when he said Good and evil, they are not equal. Even if the abundance of evil might impress you. This is a valuable principle, especially in times of confusion and prevalence of sin. It endows the Muslim with a benchmark to measure beliefs to measure trends, to measure behaviors, appearances, um, events, incomes, and their likes. Because man, by his nature, he inclines to what is larger and greater in quantity over that which is lesser. He is drawn to the immediate as opposed to what is delayed. So this reality checking principle realigns man by telling him, wait, no, hold on. Quantity and instant gratification and popularity, these are crooked yardsticks when measuring right or wrong. And I want to just share with you a few examples of this Quranic process in application. The principle that says good and evil are not equal, even if you may be impressed by the abundance of evil. Number one, earnings from sources of halal and haram, they are not equal. I mean, for starters, think about the effects of the halal earning. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man prasaddaqa bi'adli tamratin min kasbin tayyib. Whoever gives in charity the value of a date from pure earnings. Look, tayyib, pure earnings. Wala yaqbalullahu illa tayyib. And Allah only accepts that which is tayyib, pure. What happens? فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَقْبَلُهَا بِيَمِينِهِ Allah accepts this charity with his right hand. ثُمَّ يُرَبِّيهَا لِصَاحِبِهَا كَمَا يُرَبِّي أَحَادُكُمْ فَلُوَّهُ Then Allah will nurture this charity. The same way you nurture your mare until it becomes the size of a mountain. So look at the barakah, the blessing of a halal charity. It grows in quantity. On the other hand, there may be a person who does so much charity, but from haram earnings, builds a masjid, digs wells, whatever it may be, and Allah may reject it. Why? Because of its source. So I ask again, can the halal and the haram sources of income be compared? The Prophet ﷺ also said, riba wa in kathur ila qul. Interest. Even if it is abundant, the outcome will always be a loss. And the Prophet ﷺ said, "Kullu jasadin nabata min haramin fannaru awla bihi." Anyone whose body grows through impermissible earnings, then the hellfire is worthier of that body. So yeah, I mean, I agree. Forbidden sources of income may offer tempting returns. They may offer the fanciest type of modern lifestyle that the intelligent Muslim sees beyond it all because he knows that his charity will be rejected. He knows that his dua will be undermined. She knows that her life will be miserable. And they know that their hereafter is at stake. So good and evil, they are not equal, even if the abundance of evil might impress you. So that's the element of comparing the halal versus haram incomes. What else can we compare in light of this principle? Say dating, as opposed to marriage. They are not equal. Which of the two is happier or whom of the two is happier? Is it he who chases a covert relationship outside of wedlock under the cover of night to spend a short-lived moment of pleasure 
that is then followed by so much guilt and piercing pain because they realize as a Muslim that the Prophet Sallallahu had seen the fornicators suffering inside of ovens within their graves. And then during those private and intimate moments in Haram, should someone knock on their door, they may both leap in fear because their conscience had already been keeping them on edge. Then should she get pregnant, Ya Allah, it's further gloom. And in many cases, it's followed by abortion, a thing which only compounds gloom and deepens regret. Honestly, does that sound like a happy person to you? Or is it the one who distances himself or herself from the forbidden? They find strength in salah and dua and Quran and knowledge, the masjid, good companionship, patiently awaiting the arrival of that spouse whom he or she marries publicly. And then look, subhanAllah, during their wedding, families are happy and gifts are offered, smiles are exchanged. There's so much happiness and then should they be intimate on that evening? Their consciousness are at peace. And should someone knock on their door, they're unfazed. And then should she become pregnant? Their happiness is compounded with the prospect of a child who will be an extension of your Islamic legacy. And then when she delivers, then you have the aqiqa feast. And families again are happy. Gifts are exchanged. Smiles are exchanged. Happiness is abundant. Honestly speaking, which of the two is happening? I agree. Those who are in extra marital relationships may be more in number than those who are not. And yeah, those marriages that started off on the wrong foot may outnumber those that did not. But are they equal? No. Good and evil, they're not equal. Even if you may be impressed by the abundance of an evil. What else does this Quranic principle help us to compare? We can compare the life of sin against a life of repentance. The life of a sinner against the life of those who are devout. Are they the same? Are they equal? Well, one of our predecessors, he said, There are some moments that my heart experiences of joy, where I say to myself, if the people of paradise are experiencing what I'm experiencing here in dunya, then they will be living a good life. So can this good life, this pure life, as Allah has described it in the Quran, be compared to its dark opposite? The life of being far away from Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي Whoever turns away from my reminder, then for him is a life of misery. Are they the same? Can these two lives be compared? Those who spend their nights in secret sin, perhaps are far more than those who see those moments as opportunities to pray and weep in yearning for their Lord. And similarly, the lifestyles of the sinners are way more promoted than the lifestyles of the devout. I agree. But the question still stands, are they equal? The principle says, good and evil, they are not equal. Even if the abundance of evil might impress you. Now, using these examples that you just heard, you now go on and apply this rule that Allah has made permissible against all of its impermissible forms. So, when assessing a financial transaction, don't limit it to the studying of how much, but extend it to how pure. When choosing friends, don't make the priority of how many, but who from the many. When considering the options over a weekend, the question is, what are other people up to? No, don't make it that question. But what should I be up to? When you've made now the resolve to adopt the hijab, cast aside what's trending and replace it with what's required. This is a principle that nurtures the believer to observe life through the lens of the hereafter, causing him to 
crave what is good and pure, even if it is little. And to abhor the impure, even if it is mountain-like and heavily promoted. And what helps the Muslim develop this perception and this differentiation is the knowledge that he has of the eventual fate of what is Khabith, the glamorous Khabith, the glamorous impurity. What does Allah say about its outcome? وَيَجْعَلَ الْخَبِيثَ بَعْضَهُ عَلَى بَعْضُ فَيَرْكُمَهُ جَمِيعًا فَيَجْعَلَهُ فِي جَهَنَّمُ He will put the impure one on top of the other, then he will heap it all together into hell. But look, I tell you this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shakur. He is appreciative. And so a person who lives his life, her life, assessing every one of their actions, according to this verse, and they patiently choose the tayyib, the good and the pure, over the khabith form, and they do this until the day they die, Allah will not leave them empty-handed. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised this person so many prizes. What is offered to you, dear Muslim, after you have chosen that life that is pure, number one, a life that is tayyib, a life that is happy and pure. Allah said, Man amila salihan, whoever works good deeds, min dhakarin aw untha, whether male or female, wa huwa mu'min, whilst having iman, fala nuhiyannahu hayatan tayyibah. We shall cause them to live a good life, a happy life, a pure life, high spirits, best of moods, peace of mind, clarity of purpose. Purity of conscience, paradise on earth, that's the first, a happy life. Number two, Allah offered them an ending that is tayyib, a dying that is tayyib. الَّذِينَ تَتَوَفَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ طَيِّبِينَ يَقُولُونَ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ The ones whom the angels take in death in a tayyib, pure and good state. The angels will say to them, peace be upon you, enter Jannah for what you used to do. So their souls will be claimed in a tayyib state, a pure state, a gentle extraction of the soul. So they will be confident in what awaits them. And they will be thrilled with the prospect of finally meeting their Lord. So a life that is tayyib, an ending that is tayyib. Number three, a place in Jannah, a home in Jannah that is tayyib, good and pure. Allah said, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Allah has promised the believing men and believing women, جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْيِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ Gardens, beneath which rivers flow, خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا Wherein they abide eternally, وَمَسَاكِنَا طَيِّبَةً And goodly mansions, طَيِّب mansions, beautiful mansions, فِي جَنَّاتِ عَدْن In gardens of perpetual residence. In conclusion, I know that at times it can be difficult to see the khabith the impure for what it is because of size or popularity or glamour, accessibility, dominance in culture. But only those people of wisdom and patience will be able to make the right decision and see it straight through its glittery but thin outer layer, even if this person is outvoted. Say to the people, the good and the evil, they are not equal, even though the abundance of evil might impress you. وبالحق أنزلناه وبالحق نزل وما أرسلناك إلا مبشرا ونذيرا وقرآنا فرقناه لتقرأه على الناس على مكث ونزلناه تنزيلا